Grace, mercy, and peace from God Almighty and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus, you know, uh, was a Protestant. No, a Protestant Jew, actually, since Christianity wasn't yet invented when Jesus was alive, let alone Protestant Christianity. But definitely, definitely a Protestant. Small p, small p, Protestant. If one of the marks of the Protestant spirit is to have reservations about the priesthood. I don't mean here simply the priesthood as we know it in Roman Catholicism, but any priesthood, any priesthood whatsoever, the very idea of a priesthood. To see this more clearly, let's consider the history and function of a priesthood. In ancient Hebrew religion, the priesthood was hereditary. That is to say, the priest was born not made. In the ancient world, but in the modern world as well, the priest has been understood to be a mediator between the divine and the human. The traditional role of the priest was to perform sacrifices to the deity and to dispense messages from the divine. The priest might also be a channel for weal and woe between divine and human beings. If God was happy with things as they were going, the priest would make this known. If God was unhappy with things, well, priest would make that known. So it goes. Reading the New Testament, it seems that Jesus was, for the most part, loyal to the system of temple priesthood. At least up to the time when he, uh, you know, you remember the story, he turns over the tables of money changers and merchants serving the business of temple sacrifices in Jerusalem. In any event, after the destruction of the temple by the Romans in the year 70 of the Common Era, it seems that Jewish Christians began to oppose the sacrificial system over which the priests presided and to give ever greater religious authority to those who spoke as prophets. This was an important shift that would become absolutely crucial at the time of the Lutheran Reformation in the 16th century. I know, I'm a week early, next Sunday's Reformation, but what can you do? When Martin Luther, when Martin Luther challenged Rome regarding church practices, he was not at first challenging the papacy or the system of the Roman priesthood. He had observed corruptions in the church, and his initial intention was merely to alert the Pope to the fact of these corruptions. On the supposition, on the supposition that the Pope would want nothing more than to root out these corruptions from the church. When Luther realized that the corruption he had detected ran all the way up to the top and to the papacy itself, Luther looked more deeply into the institution of the Roman Church, among these being the priesthood. And not just the practices of the priesthood in his day, but the very idea of a Christian priesthood. The result of this is that Lutherans, Protestants in general, do not have a priesthood or priests. I know, the, the Episcopalians do something or other, but we can't figure that out. <laughs> but what's wrong with the priesthood? Well, the short answer, the short answer is mumbo-jumbo. 
But the question deserves a somewhat longer answer. Let's go back to the two essential functions of a priest, which could, you know, they could be folded into one, but which we will keep distinct. The functions are to provide an intermediary between God and the worshiper and to make the sacrifices necessary to get God's attention and to win God's favor for the people whom the priest serves. In the Roman Catholic system, the priesthood, you know, is not inherited, or at least it's not an inheritance by blood. Rather, the priesthood is the result of something called apostolic succession, which is supposed to go back to the time of St. Peter and the other disciples who were deemed apostles. Now, as the story goes, Jesus commissioned Peter to be the primary disciple. From this, the Roman church would derive the institution of the papacy. But Peter and all the apostles were generally the ones whose mission commission was to pass on their apostolic authority through the laying on of hands, which works as follows. Here's the way it works. The original apostles, they determine who is fit to be a representative of Jesus. And by the symbolic act of putting their hands on the candidates' heads, transfer their apostolic authority bestowed on them by Jesus to subsequent generations. I think this is why I became bald. But this process, by this process, contemporary priests are supposed to be, are supposed to be in direct and unbroken line with Jesus' original apostles, and it is from this that the priests derive their authority. People like myself (laughs) ordained in the Lutheran church. We're not in the lineup. And so we lack what is required to be priests. This is the penalty of our Protestantism, or maybe, as I'm inclined to think, it is the blessing of our Protestantism. There are many priests whom I respect and of whom I am fond, but I admit, oh, you could tell, I am no fan of the priesthood. And I want you to know, I want to assure you that this is not just sour grapes because I'm not in the club. So let's think about this just a little bit more. Concerning the matter of an intermediary between ourselves and God, it seems to me that this was more than taken care of by Jesus in whom is communicated for Christians the nature and the will of God and who shows us in his life and teachings what it means to be godly persons. We don't need more mediators than Jesus. Let's stick with him. Okay, let's stick with Jesus. Secondly, I think it's high time we had done with the idea of sacrifice as a means of being related to God. It's not difficult to understand the logic of religious sacrifice. It goes something like this. We do bad. We get it wrong. We sin. Or we long for something such as good crops, secure family, freedom from enemy attack, things which are apparently beyond our control. And so we seek to appease or cajole the powers above us, the gods, God, and get them to do our bidding by the blandishment of sacrifice. The sacrifice that is offered should be of some value in order to be convincing and show that the one who makes the sacrifice is really serious about the matter in question. In this way, the powers above, the gods, God, 
are won over and they come to the rescue. It is the priests who know the mumbo jumbo in order to make the sacrifices effective. As I say, we can understand the logic of religious sacrifice even as we wonder, do we not? What sort of deity could be won over by such intercessions? Surely not the God that we've come to know in the person of Jesus. And to make Jesus into God's sacrifice to God, as has been believed by Christians throughout the centuries and up to the present, is, I would say, fairly bizarre. Again, we can understand the logic. Humankind rejected God, right? Sin of Adam. A sin so great that it could never be atoned for by human beings. So, it's God who must make the the sacrifice. And God offers a substitute. A scapegoat in the form of Jesus, God's only son, who is made to stand in for us and make restitution to God and make our forgiveness possible. A sacrifice by God to God. We can understand the logic, but tell me, please, please tell me, what sense does it make? We find Christian roots for this sort of thinking in the letter to the Hebrews, elegantly read by Rich this morning, where we find Jesus presented as the unblemished, sacrificial victim and sinless high priest, marking the end of the priesthood that was a mainstay of Old Testament devotion. It is only in Hebrews that the word priest is ever applied to Jesus. And this may be related to verse 25 of our gospel for today. It is speculated that the anonymous writer of the letter to the Hebrews may have been saying what he says in order to convince Jewish Christians not to go back to their old beliefs in the sacrificial system, inasmuch as Jesus was the sacrifice par excellence and the only one that they would ever need. Who knows? But might there be a better way to do this? Might there not be a better way to do this? And by better, I mean a way more in keeping with the picture of Jesus that we find in the Gospels. Why not just deny altogether that Jesus is a priest? Not a high priest, not a low priest, and that on the contrary, he's the end of all priestliness. Instead, he is the incarnation of God's love in human flesh to show us how to live lives that are godly and thereby to save us from lovelessness. Jesus is for us the word of God, at once revealing who God is and who we are as we stand before God. There's no need for us to think of him as a sacrifice. When the priest stands at the altar for the Eucharist in the Roman Catholic Mass, he is believed to be replaying the sacrifice of Jesus and is himself at that moment functioning as the vehicle for this sacrifice. The sacrifice then is played out over and over and over and over and over and over and over over again. But why think this? Why hang on to this idea of sacrifice? Wouldn't it be enough to understand Jesus to be the truthful witness to the God of love in the face of that lovelessness, that terrible lovelessness that would kill an innocent person for living a truthful life? As such, Jesus is not a sacrifice to stand in for us. 
and lift from us the burden of living in a world of brutality and confusion. But rather, Jesus is the model for how we are to live in a world like this one. He is for us not a sacrifice, but he's the way, the truth, and the life that leads to God. Our job as Christians is not to admire Jesus from afar as the sacrificial victim playing a role that no one else can play, but to allow him to follow him as closely as we are able in the living of our lives. Not this Jesus afar, this Jesus close. When Jesus asked the disciples if they were able to drink the cup he drinks and be baptized with his baptism, they answered, we are able. In so saying, they tell him that they are prepared to follow him. And that is what they did, and some of them even followed him to their deaths. This is the way that Christian ministers are made. We choose to do our best to live in Luther's homely phrase, as little Christs. We say we are able, and then we do our best. For this, I submit to you, we do not need priests. We do not even need Jesus to be our priest. What we need is to believe that the word of God is truly represented in him and then to live by that word as best we are able. And so, by the grace of God, we will do just that. That's our faith. No mumbo-jumbo. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts, your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.